Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody and the panelists turns their cameras off because those are some nice and familiar faces that comfort me. Uh, we've been working here together since January to arrive to this event today. Uh, there have been many obstacles, a lot of challenges, pivots, but even more learnings. This was a living lab where we met every Thursday for 16 weeks, early mornings for those in the United Kingdom and late afternoons for those in Australia. Sometimes from the office, sometimes from a car, sometimes from a beach, but these fellows consistently showed up and experimented with Web3 tooling in the art space. My name is Kitty Borissa, and I hosted these calls over the last 16 Thursdays. So I'm very excited and to be honest, also a little bit emotional to host this last one where the art institutions will show you their Web3 experiments. Some are working prototypes, some are paper prototypes, and some are going live on major exhibitions this summer. Today, we are going around the world. We are going to meet people from Australia, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. Uh, the agenda is long, so please bear with us. We are going to have two plus one hours in total. In the first 30 minutes, we celebrate and we listen to some remarks of the current state of the digital art on the blockchain. Um, and then the institutions will present their precious projects. We are, we are finishing in a virtual networking event that is going to be on a different Zoom link. So if you in the audience are an artist or a journalist or a blockchain developer or maybe an investor and you want to meet some of these institutions and collaborate with them or support them in any way, we have a meeting for you prepared. So you are welcome to join at the very end. You will also be able to ask questions in the chat over the presentations. And this is a Web3 event. So of course, we have a proof of attendance token for you that you can claim only if you are here today. Uh, my colleagues are going to share the link to claim the token in the chat, hopefully a few times over the course of today. And Diane, if you are ready, I invite you to share your screen. Uh, Diane is a long-standing member of the innovation and the museum community. Back in 2012, she founded VR Museums as an innovation lab del delving into collective intelligence to create a community of support and practice. After exploring digital, social, and environmental innovations of museums, the last focus of VR Museums is obviously Web3 and blockchain technology with Vac Lab. Diane, the mic is yours. Thank you, Kitty. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be finally here with you today at the demo day of season two of WAC Fellowship. It has been months that we are actually waiting for it, so it's um, super exciting. So let me take you on a little journey, which actually started in 2021, not four months ago, but yeah, in 2021. WAC, also called WAC, or as um, people will say, the long version, Web3 for the Art and Culture, is not just an ordinary program. It's a laboration, it's an innovation laboratory that dares to explore the incredible potential of blockchain technology for the art and culture. From the very beginning, we've had some incredible friends. Work Lab have been, has been powered by the Tezos blockchain with unwavering support from the Tezos Foundation and its local entities, including TZ Connect. Um, we also had the pleasure to collaborate from the start with Blockchain Art Directory and Lal Art, led by the amazing Fanina Kubem, and of course, the team of We Are Museums uh, web designed and produced this program from the start. Um, we now, um, sorry, now let's dive into the, the magic that unfolds within WAC Lab. So it's a three act play, each part brooding upon, upon the other, all leading us to, um, to the forefront of Web3 innovation in the art world. So act one is WAC Weekly, uh, it's our vibrant online discussion uh, online discussion program. Sorry, so picture a virtual gathering of art and cultural professionals coming together to share their ideas, insights, and the latest buzz for, from the Web three space. 
Um, I have that in mind, imagine that every week for 25 weeks in a row, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. CST. So, you know, that's that's something that we do as work, at work. We create some habits. So for the work fellowship, we can every Thursday morning, work weekly every every um, Wednesday evening. But it is really thanks to the time that we spent together that we started to nurture a really open and caring environment where good practices, precious innovation, uh, precious tips and innovation can be shared. Now we can move to the act two, which is actually the heart of it all, the WAC Fellowship. Um, so here we embarked on an inspiring journey with 12 uh, cultural institutions and artists from all around the world. They dived headfirst into the captivating world of blockchain and Web3. Through three months of online training, workshops, mentoring, but also personalized coaching, the teams have been prepared to become Web3 literates and create their very own innovative projects using blockchain technology. And now we arrive at the big reveal, the Act 3, Work Factory, and that's really where the magic happens. So um, we had a four-week sprint where um, um, the Work Factory really acted like an innovation accelerator for museums. The um, 12 teams have been um, uh, collaborating with blockchain tech integrators, full stack devs, and UI UX designers to harness the power of blockchain for the art and culture. Together, they unlock the, po the, the potential for cultural preservation, social good, environmental justice, and financial sustainability. But you will discover all of that, so I won't go too far into the details. Um, but before we proceed to witness the project developed, I would like to welcome Valerie Whitaker, Head of Art at Trilli Tech, the hub of the Tezos, from, uh, the Tezos ecosystem. Valerie will share with us the deep commitment of Tezos for the art and culture. And she has been supporting us um, since last year and always being really good, um, uh, always providing really good guidance and support. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us on this beautiful journey. <laughs> and I can't wait uh, yet to hear the different pitches, the different teams, and then have this um, hour of networking with you all. Thank you so much, uh, Diane, and also um, I, a huge thank you to everyone at We Are Museums um, and uh, LAL Art. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Most of all, congratulations to all of you. Um, it was a, a really um, a huge journey, I realize, and I know that there were a lot of different applications to get into this program as well. It's been fantastic uh, having updates from Diane um, along the way, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. I want to really emphasize that the Tezos ecosystem is built on arts and culture. Uh, arts and culture is its main activity. Uh, the community that uh, burgeoned in 2021 in November, starting with Rafael Lima's Hikignanc in Brazil, is frankly a historic moment. Um, I don't believe there's any moment in art history that even parallels to what's being created here on Tezos what's what's growing and what continues to be um, light and inspiration for many. Equally, the tools and the platforms that we're seeing built to solve real world problems, problems for institutions such as yours, opportunities for institutions such as yours, um, is frankly just inspiring. Uh, and we really, really love to see how much is being done within the ecosystem as well as outside of it um, to support arts and culture at large uh, across the world. We do need more. Uh, involvement from institutions looking at these platforms, understanding the opportunities within them. And I think this program is a pivotal key, turnkey uh, opportunity for, for institutions like yourselves, but also your other community members and sister institutions to start learning how we can leverage uh, the, the Tezos protocol, blockchain technology at large, and also to create new forms of patronage and inspiration. Uh, art at the heart is something that we do because we love it. Uh, many of us here likely sacrificed other career choices just to be within the art space. And it's fantastic to see that there's an entire new movement that can really bring new life and, and new opportunities to the industry and the sector. I think what you've all achieved here is also incredibly important because it's about shared knowledge. 
Uh, collaboration in the art world is something that uh, I think arguably we've all seen uh, diminish perhaps in more recent times. And it's really amazing to see it come back to life uh, through blockchain, through an ecosystem of peer-to-peer -peer networks, and through the opportunities that the Tezos ecosystem has supported. So congratulations for being forward thinking enough to collaborate in this space, to share ideas, to hopefully drive further innovation uh, using both the Tezos platforms that exist, as well as I'm sure many ideas that you have to make your own custom solutions for your institution, for your audiences, and for your regions. I'm really looking forward to hearing about all of them. Uh, thank you very much uh, again for all of your efforts. I know it has been an incredibly, uh, it's been an endurance and a marathon um, sprint at the same time. So uh, congratulations to you all. And I really look forward to hearing what, what you've ach achieved and thought of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, and I think we have Natasha who arrived here already. Natasha, if I'm correct, then you have a presentation. Would you like to share your screen? Okay, thank you very much. Natasha Lau is the event manager of TZ APEC, the leading adoption, adoption organization for the Tezos blockchain in the Asia and the Pacific area. Natasha, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kitty. Uh, thank you, Diane and uh, Valerie. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to first congratulate everyone and to the Wetlex uh, team for the journey that you have all embarked on. Um, I'm excited to be here to meet everyone and to listen to all the projects this mo uh, morning. So uh, yes, as Kitty has mentioned, TZ APAC is the adoption, APAC adoption entity for the Tesla blockchain. And I'll be speaking very, very specifically about the TZ APAC's approach in developing the APAC uh, Tezos art community, and I'll end up with a really quick snapshot um, of the region. So, uh, sorry, yeah, so basically TZAPEC aims to really empower the local art communities um, within each of the countries in the region and to sort of facilitate bridges between the NFT space and traditional art market. And we do so in the following sort of brave, uh, various approaches. So the first would be in real life um, activations. And our goal is to always highlight and elevate our APEC creators to the region and to also establish a presence within and develop our relationships with the traditional art market. So in, in highlighting, we ensure that there's diversity in the creators from the region in terms of nationality and aesthetic styles. Um, and for in, in terms of elevation, we don't just showcase artists or creators who have a certain level of popularity or presence. Um, we take the opportunity to maintain a certain percentage of showcasing artists and creators who are up and coming. We take the opportunity to maintain a certain percentage and who don't perhaps not have the same level of popularity or presence. Um, for the examples, race being at Moments Jakarta um, uh, in Indonesia and Sea Focus uh, in Singapore, we have partnered with both events in consecutive years in varying capacities. Our approach is to ensure that there's longevity in our partnership. So we look to expand on or find additional ways to collaborate and participate in a way by tapping into their network and their audience, such as programming um, outside of these activations or um, finding sort of strategic relationships that we can build on in the future. So next thing that we do as well at TZA PAC is we also have creative community mixes. And the main goal is to really provide and facilitate a frequent an open physical space for connecting. So to function beyond as just a space of just providing food and drinks and a good time, but more intentionally, you know, as a gap, uh, there's a gap that has been identified, which is the lack of a common space um, that is conducted frequent enough. So we wanted to fill that gap by creating a frequent open physical space for creatives to come together, to connect with one another, but most importantly, to um, reconnect with one another. We open up our creative community mixes to not only just our creator community, but as well as our periphery connections, uh, regardless of whether or not they create on Tezos or even if they are on Web3. We want our creative community to grow. And the way that we, we intend to do that is to be a space that is open and welcome uh, with the intention of building relationships. Um, lastly, in TZIPEC, we have something called the Ecosystem Growth Grant. So this is our small strategic uh, grants. Um, where we award up to 10,000 USD to initiatives or projects that grow, uh, that drive the growth and adoption of the larger Tesla's ecosystem. So, so whilst this grant, um, you know, takes on other projects that's not necessarily under the arts vertical, but specifically for the arts, the intention is to support the growth of the arts community in the multitude and possibilities and in initiatives. So we support community and creator-led initiatives that, such as workshops, programs, minting parties, 
Um, we also support existing projects. So um, what you see here, Pentas, uh, Pentas.io is actually a Southeast Asian NFT marketplace with the founders and the team from Malaysia. Um, and we supported them for their integration of Tezos into their marketplace. Um, recently, we also awarded a grant to the Manila Philippines uh, Draper Startup House for their Artist Collective Residency and Incubator Program. So um, APEC, Tezos Art Community in a snapshot. Um, within APEC, our Tezos Art Community in Indonesia and Philippines are what we consider to be thriving. These communities have self-organized and developed organically over time, so much so that they have garnered recognition and are considered leaders for the Tezos art within their own countries. For example, in Indonesia, a local newspaper sought the consult and guidance of Meta Rupa um, to launch their first ever NFT collection on Tezos. In the past year alone, um, through our ecosystem grant, as well as being on ground and being in touch with the various communities and creators, we've also seen an increase in efforts to grow the Tezos art communities in Thailand, Malaysia, and Taiwan, and as well as Japan. So initiatives are sort of more focused on the exposure, education, and onboarding, on, and they are increasing, and they are either led by individual creators or smaller groups, with the intention of growing and expanding their local Tezos creator communities. Um, the aesthetic form that is most prominent uh, in APEC uh, is illustration. So in our TZ APEC produced showcases as well as community led programs, um, it is the most prominent in this, even though there's interest in, um, in a small handful of creators dabbling in AI generative art, it is still less common. Um, and we also believe that it's important to be representative of the APEC region by showcasing and elevating the sheer vibrancy and diversity and quality of work that already exists um, but that being said, you know, we are really excited about the growing interest and endeavor into AI and generative art um, within the APEC region. So, yeah, so that's pretty much wraps up um, my snapshot of the APEC region. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Thank you very much, Natasha. I hope you can stay for the networking event because I know some of the teams might be interested in your grants program. Uh, but now we are getting to the most exciting part. So over the next a bit more than an hour, we are going to hear from all the institutions who participated in this program. The teams will have four minutes uh, to show their project and tell about the future plans. And then the audience have an opportunity for a question. I encourage you to think about questions because it helps you to actively listen and it also helps the teams to feel heard and to express themselves better. So I will ask a question from the chat after after the talk of every team. And if you don't get the answer for all of your questions, you can join the networking event after, after the demos. So you can learn from the teams. Uh, our first one is Constance. Constance, please share your screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello. Uh, Constance is uh, the International Projects and Development Officer and her team from the Musée d'Orsay have been working on new source of revenues and community building through di digital souvenir. So she will tell us more about it. Constance, the mic is yours. You're muted. Thanks a lot, Kitty. Yeah, I wasn't mute. Good. Hi, everyone. Happy to go first. Um, so my name is Constance. I'm working in the development department of the Musée d'Orsay and the Musée de l'Orangerie. So to talk more specifically about the Musée d'Orsay, you see a picture here. Um, it's a former railway station built in 1900 that now encloses one of the biggest collection of 19th century masterpieces, paintings, sculptures, photographs, uh, among others. So um, the link, the immediate link with Web3 was maybe not completely clear at the beginning, but when we decided to onboard on the um, WAC Fellowship, on the WAC Fellowship, our main question for our institution, a public cultural institution, was how to start the conversation on Web3. Um, and the idea was to explore the bridges we could create between our 19th century collections, our history, this exciting web free ecosystem that was completely new to us and find ways to connect with the web free communities as well as our with our more traditional audiences because we need also them on board at some point so we identified three main pillars uh, that have driven our reflection so far and also throughout the WAC fellowship 
the question of innovation, of course, uh, it seems um, um, very clear here now that we are all gathered, but as a public cultural institution, we have to be consistent with social and technological evolutions and to deeply understand how people interact with culture in general. Web3 is opening a very wide exploration field that can serve among others a mission of cultural uh, democratization. It also allows us to reveal ourselves under a new light. Um, with Musée d'Orsay has long been perceived, we've made studies a few years ago, as a kind of innovating, uh, sorry, not innovating, uh, a bit academic, um, a bit old. So this is also a way for us to talk about us in a different way and also to reach differently uh, new audiences using new codes. And eventually, uh, we think that the strong philanthropic mindsets of the web free communities is also an interesting field to develop when it comes to diversify ways to fund the museum's projects and preserve our building and unique collections. So we thought uh, about two steps we want to take in the following month. I will not enter today into the specifics uh, since there is a lot that still needs to be confirmed, but there are already two routes that we have in mind um, between 2023 and 2024. By end of 2023, we would like to test with our audience uh, on site and online the idea of a digital souvenir, uh, a new kind of product that would give the buyers exclusive uh, advantages. It would also create for us a first basis of contacts for upcoming web free projects. Um, it should take place this autumn. Uh, so we are currently working uh, on it. And I hope we could make some more formal announcements in the upcoming weeks. As for the second ID uh, in 2024 is the 150th anniversary of Impressionism. And we think it could be the best timing to create a dialogue between our collections and web free artists. Right now, what you see on screen is not what is planned. We don't have a project finalized, uh, but as you can see, it's a um, uh, current uh, web free artist that got inspired by the water lilies of Claude Monet, which are in our collections. Um, so this idea, the second step that we want very ambitious, it could take many forms, but at this point, the project is still work in progress. Um, uh, so we are thinking about a lot of things, co-creation events, um, installation um, in different places, locations, conferences, program, auction sales. I hope, we hope as the Musée d'Orsay to communicate more in the upcoming month. Um, until then, uh, I thank you all a lot for your attention. Thank you, Constance. Uh, I'm looking at the chat to see whether there are questions from the audience. Uh, I can wait a little bit to see if someone is coming up, but if not, I for sure have one, um, which is, <laughs> I'm curious whether this is part of a, a larger initiative uh, are you planning to introduce more technology or you plan to work with more digital artists? What, what are the bigger goals of Musée d'Orsay? Well, okay. well, I think, well, Impressionism for a start, you know, our Impressionist artists were criticized. There was a question of aesthetic. It is really art. And we think there's like a very strong parallel to create what, what is perceived for the greater public of web free artists sometimes. So as a public cultural institution, it's very important that we yeah, are in the center of society and, the, and that we try to really create the debate and to, as I was saying, start the conversation. We have this role to also educate and to um, transmit some knowledge. So I think there's, I think a very interesting link that could be done with these web-free artists. Asking them to yeah, think about us with a different project. But for now, uh, yeah, we still need to, specify a few a few points and to also onboard a lot of uh, people internally but with the work fellowship it really allowed us throughout the 24 weeks every week um, uh, a lot of, of people within the museum had a had a heads up on what was happening so 
most most teams know what's happening on Web3 for, for the museum. Thank you so much. And we have another question. How does an artist get involved from Australia? Ah, oh, well, <laughs> we don't... <laughs> From Australia, I, well, the idea is my, we might go international. I, uh, for now, we, uh, I don't think we sh would uh, limit ourselves to French artists. But right now, I, I, can't, I don't know what will be the parameters of it all. But I mean, we have international visitors, so I don't know why we should limit ourselves. OK, so maybe if the, the given artist is here in the audience, then maybe you can reach out to Constance and talk about it Definitely. after the session. And our next presenter is going to be Ugo. Ugo, please share your screen. Uh, Ugo Pecorayo is the head of communications and his team at the House of Electronic Arts took the first steps towards a new Web3 journey for HACK, including more collaborations with artists, a tokenized museum membership, and a future DAO. Ugo, the mic is yours. Please tell us more. Hi, everyone. Um, Ian, can you share the video? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Uga and here to speak on behalf of HEK, House of Electronic Arts in Basel, Switzerland. At HEC, I'm head of communications and responsible for Web3 implementation in the museum. Together with my dear colleagues, uh, Sabine, Boris, Barbara, Isabella, and the whole team of HEC, we embarked on our Web3 journey last year. Part of this new program of Web3 exploration called Hack Connect. We have already launched our virtual exhibition space and the educational program. I'm excited to introduce you today to our next step, the Hack NFT shop, developed during the VAC Fellowship in collaboration with Smart Chain. We didn't want uh, the shop to be a regular NFT marketplace and wish to make it artists first. That's why the Hack Shop will aggregate artworks minted on multiple NFT marketplaces and multiple uh, blockchains, giving the least technical limitation to the artist as possible. We wanted to offer a platform to feature the works of artists we collaborate with and create a place where digital art meets contemporary museology. Each edition presents independent creation or ex extension of existing artworks by internationally acclaimed media artists. For the first drop in our newly created Hack NFT shop, we work together with Leander Herzog, a Swiss leading artist when it comes to creative coding and generative art. He will create a unique generative edition, which will be presented on June 11th in our shop. Soon, more collaboration will be featured in the shop. But that's not all on our journey with the project of Hack Connect. In June, we are going beyond geographical borders. We will publish a tokenized membership and create an extended circle of friends with our Hack DAO. Within the DAO, all members will be actively involved in the curatorial process of our online exhibitions and social space virtual hack.ch. Each step we take towards more Web3 adaption serves the mission of Hack. As a museum and platform for contemporary art that explores and employs new technologies and encourages a critical discourse on the aesthetic, social, political, and economic effects of media technologies. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, see you on June 11th online to discover the new piece of Leander Herzog. That's all from me for now. Thank you very much, Hugo. And thank you. We, we have time for one question. Uh, my my question is, what do you do with people who don't have crypto? How do they get involved? Um, we will set up um, the possibility to pay in fiat, to pay in regular money, and also um, hack in the DAO, in the future DAO, uh, we will provide a service that we kind of can embark or uh, onboard everyone uh, that we host their wallets uh, to be involved, even if they don't have a wallet. Um, and uh, people will then learn uh, with us together uh, on how they can get the wallet and then can be involved completely. 
Thank you. And we have a bit of time for one more. So what is it that you demand from your DAO members? Um, involvement. <laughs> No, um, they can um, vote uh, on exhibition on our online um, space, uh, virtualhack.ch. Um, they can participate in a curatorial process, in a swarm curated process, but they, uh, we also offer um, discussions and talks with artists. So everyone can be like one big circle of friends who like, be very much involved with a curatorial process for an online exhibition space at HEC. Thank you very much, Hugo. It's been such a pleasure to follow your journey over these Thank you so much. few months. And our next on stage is going to be Indigo and Arie. Please share your screen. Uh, and please welcome the Aus Australian Center for the Mo Moving Image. Indigo Holcomba James is a strategic research lead and Ari Offman is a public programmer and video games curator. The team was working on long-term strategic go goals and is ready to share about their research. Indigo, the mic is yours. Thanks, Kitty. It's so great to be here with our colleagues and mentors after all this time. Uh, it's been a really exciting journey. So ACME is Australia's Museum of Screen Culture, and we're deeply invested in understanding and learning more about the opportunities that advances in digital technologies present both us as a cultural organisation, but also our audiences. And the WAC Fellowship has been such a great initiative for building ACME's Web3 literacy. And we're so grateful for the opportunities, learnings and networks that we've developed through this process. We had quite a large contingent of staff on this journey. Uh, and these staff were from across the museum, from our IT department, pseudo experience, curatorial and programming, which has meant that our learnings were underpinned by quite diverse institutional viewpoints and have the opportunity to feed into quite diverse institutional practices. We ended up landing on a paper prototype of an NFT minting experience that makes use of our lens technology. So the lens is here. It's a free handhold take home device that uses NFT chips and readers to enable visitors to explore the artworks and objects they discover in our exhibitions after their visit. And we wanted to make sure our paper prototype built off this investment and made use of this technology. And Ari's going to tell you more about that. Thanks, Indigo. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the considerations we had when, when deciding to go down the route of exploring a paper prototype was, first of all, um, ACME's place within uh, and uh, practice of building large-scale exhibitions that not only uh, inhabit our building here within Melbourne, Australia, but actually tour museums worldwide. And so we really wanted to, to explore a practice that, that, that provided a use case scenario across um, future exhibition building, um, future exhibition building experiences and scenarios, and really looking at it from a visitor journey experience. Um, particularly given, you know, the the integral nature of the the technology and the lens as um, as to how we think about curatorially putting together an exhibition, and also about how a, a visitor experiences our exhibition, and uh, we really wanted to integrate that with Web three technologies and specifically um, uh, a live minting process. Um, so uh, sort of thinking about the visitor journey, we were really interested in for, like uh, making it as smooth as possible, particularly given that they're going to be onboarded to just probably not one piece of new technology being the, the Web3 aspect, but also the other the piece of technology that's integral to our exhibition, which is our lens. So visitors potentially could be able to purchase an NFT um, minting add-on with their initial ticket purchase, which would then generate a QR code that helps to smooth and um, uh, to speed up the end of exhibition on like um, onboarding experience. Um, we also think integral to to uh, visit a journey through any of our exhibitions is is the onboarding to that lens technology, which which is attached to all of the the objects and the items that are exhibited throughout and provide a, a range of um, uh, content that is available online for visitors to be able to continue continue their journey, not just whilst they're in a physical uh, building space. 
Um, but what's also really interesting about that is that it provides a continual stream of real-time quantitative data from our visitors and how they actually are interacting with an exhibition experience. And we think that's a really exciting way to, to potentially work um, with a generative artist in the future and to see how a visitor's experience of an exhibition potentially would affect an artwork in real time that then can be collected. Um, we would look to showcase what that generative artwork would be towards the end of the exhibition and, of course, onboard visitors into any wallop, wallet setup process uh, and minting processes. Um, and, of course, then um, uh, additional content would be available for them through, um, through the ACME post-visit experience. Um, and uh, through, I guess, their experience with both minting NFTs, Web3 technologies, but also the, the content that they've collected through their lens technology. Um, yeah, it's been a really great experience to be part of this fellowship. I think it's really opened up our eyes to, to, um, to Web3 and uh, its place within the cultural landscape currently. And um, yeah, we're happy to answer any questions you've got about our, our prototype. Thank you, Aria. We have a lot of questions. Great news. Uh, Love it. So many visitors who enter museums are members of the local museums. Would these NFTs minted also act as a membership to the institution? Um, potentially, uh, like uh, um, I think the you know the NFTs that are minted have a, a broad again a broad use case scenario. I suppose um, with the prototype that we've crafted, it's not something that we're looking at uh, like with a single letter, like NFT drop. Potentially, it could be applied across future exhibition builds as well. And again, given the the international sort of touring status of, of many of the exhibitions that are created at ACME, uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't um, be uh, a rest on being membership only, but it's definitely one of the potential use, uses that we could see within our within, within our museum. Thank you. And how to connect with ACME? Will they be will you be outsourcing the lens NFT chip? for other galleries and Tezos events for the Tezos community in Australia. Uh, Indigo, did you want to talk a little bit about um, maybe XOS and some of the stuff that might be available online for people, resources that we've made available? Yeah, absolutely. So ACME is really uh, committed to supporting the cultural sector around the technology work that we do. Um, I highly recommend checking out our website and uh, ACME Labs, which is our medium uh, website where we document and keep all of our learnings on there for further uh, dissemination across the sector. Um, please do feel free to get in touch. At the moment, all of this is uh, hypothetical, but we're, we're looking forward to continuing the journey. Well, I think one of the things we, we can just uh, say a little bit further is that ACME is is committed to to again furthering like um technologies integration within worldwide cultural institutions and makes many of its uh experiments and things available through open source programming through githubs through all of those kind of things so again if you kind of deep dive uh through the various things through the acme site um there there is a wealth of resources to discover thank you very much and we have another question from lena uh are there any specific items from your collections that you're thinking about in relation to connecting this technology to? Yeah, so look, that's a it's a really good question. Um, Acme has a, like any a really large collection um, uh, of over two hundred and fifty thousand um, objects, items, um, uh, pieces of media, etc. That that go throughout Australia's screen cultural history. Um, I think, look, it's something that we were definitely interested in exploring in the future, but um, given how how things are accessioned into the ACME collection, um, particularly with given that we work within screen media and those things, often there are quite complicated rights cases and things to do with how, how we work with different objects within the ACME collection as well. Um, also, I think it's interesting because many of them are born, are born digital um, items. And so I think that's something that we're going to find more and more as to how we might utilise Web3 technologies in, in managing a, in a screen cultural and born digital collection like Acme's. Thank you so much. It sounds like lots of people are interested in what you do. It's unfortunate that you cannot stay for the networking because it's getting late for you. Uh, but I'm sure you're going to be available on Twitter 
So if anybody wants to stay in touch with you, Twitter is a good platform, I, I believe so. And our next one on stage is Lina. Lina, please share your screen. Uh, Lina Dob Dobrovolska is an artist researcher and an educator in the Lo Royal College of Art. She's working across photography, film installation, and computer simulation. She explores the nexus between human rights and climate change in her practice. She's here to tell us more about the project that she built during the fellowship. It's really inspiring. Lena, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, Kitty. I will just echo Acme's sentiment that it's a really exciting uh, thing to be here, but also quite emotional because it's the end of this journey. But without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my uh, project, Future News, a co-creative climate storytelling NFT. Going into this fellowship, I was interested in impact NFTs in funding climate research with blockchain technology. My practice is concerned with collaboration and co-creation. Um, and I have been thinking about ways in which meaningful inclusion of audiences and various stakeholders groups uh, who are engaged in my project could happen in climate storytelling and advocacy projects more generally. So my WAC experiment builds upon a multi-platform project titled Future Scenarios that we have worked on for the past six years which looked at deteriorating and improving scenarios of climate change through the prism of climate impacts that are already happening on the ground in climate sensitive locations. And as part of this project, we have reworked covers of iconic magazines with appropriated imagery to tell speculative future news stories that encourage us to stretch our imagination and consider alternative versions of the future while looking critically at often simplified media narratives that can give rise to certain types of framings. And we wanted to extend this process of invigoration of public imagination around climate futures. And rather than create a singly authored NFT, we came up with a storytelling tool in the form of a future newspaper cover generator. This generator tools is, tool is intended to be used as part of scenario thinking workshops, which contextualize our work and run alongside our exhibitions. The tool was designed in collaboration with software designer Davide Chaco, and you should be able to see the link to the prototype in the chat now. The user interface is very simple. It consists of a mixture of visual parameters, which allow you to customize visual and textual aspects of the cover and narrative variables that were inspired by parameters used in scientific climate simulations such as temperature increase and level of decarbonization. Last Monday, I ran a hypothetical scenario thinking workshop with my students here at the Royal College of Art. And these are some of the covers that they generated. The headlines ranged from multi-species stories to narratives proposing solutions for climate related human impacts, such as climate displacement. Some of the qualitative feedback shared indicated that the tool could offer accessibility when working with groups from non-creative backgrounds and that the format of newspaper cover was a provocative and fun tool for contextualizing climate knowledge. In terms of <clears throat> what is happening next with the project, um, we're still developing the tool and working out if we should do a giveaway or an addition to sale with all income going to climate grassroots initiatives and climate research. But either way, the project will launch on the 13th of July as part of Photodox Festival in Munich. If you want to support us, please give a prototype a go and email us a screenshot of your cover design, as well as help us to amplify the project. Lastly, my personal pledge to blockchain community is for more ambition on climate action. Sustainability and decarbonization is very important, but it's just one part of the story. We need more alternative climate finance pledges, particularly for loss and damage funds, to finance further research, as well as support those who are already bearing the brunt of climate impacts and those who are doing the necessary and important work on the ground. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you'd like to hear more about the project, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you very much, Lina, and congratulations again. Uh, your, this project is something that was existing before, and then you decided 
uh, that you integrate and integrate NFTs. What has been challenging for you? <clears throat> well, so the project already has a digital arm. So there is a iDoc interactive documentary website. You can you can find this project archived on futurescenarios.co.uk. So looking at Web3 was really another way of thinking about this digital arm of this project. I guess the most challenging aspect is thinking around co-creation and doing something like an additioned artwork and kind of thinking about future trajectories for um for going into this direction, mainly around, again, inclusion of different audiences as the project is, you know, continuously being exhibited and just finding ways of creating feedback loops between the, the people involved in the project and those who come and see and learn about the issues that the, the project explores. So these are still challenges, how to do this in a meaningful way uh, beyond, um, financing because I think that's not the main aspect of this of this experiment. Thank you very much. Uh, and what do you think what are the most promising opportunities in Web3 to help with climate change? Many would say Web3 is making climate change worse. So how do you look at this? I think it's a big question, you know, I think there are and like I said, I think the sort of it's really important to make it less energy efficient, but that's I don't think that that's the 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 only uh, arena at which blockchain should be thinking about um, about their mission. Uh, I think now during SBs in Bonn, uh, which are like sort of midterm negotiations between COP, there will be actually a panel around blockchain and carbon trading. So I think there are a lot of um, a lot of potentials in relation to um, you know tracing carbon footprint and 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 kind of applications that are already done in sort of fashion and supply chains. From the perspective of a storyteller, I think again um, more opportunities for transdisciplinary practice with actors from other fields, being science or finance or um, you know, or software engineering, um, as well as, again, creating meaningful feedbacks between the consumers of stories and those who features in, feature in stories or the stories are about. Because I think a big aspect about climate storytelling is no longer about, you know, giving voice to a, a, a community that is impacted. It's about providing platforms and creating meaningful feedback loops that can benefit those communities directly. Thank you very much, Lina, and we see you in Munich. And <laughs> we try it out. I hope. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next on stage is going to be Thais and Alex. So please get ready and share your screen. Alex Koritsky is the CTO of Teta Arts, and Thais Poda is the founder of Art Aegis, which is a collaboration of, U of the Ukrainian National Taras Shevchenko Museum and Kiev's Cultural Department. They collaborated with Lucify for an augmented reality art exhibition to exhibit Ukrainian art at a time when museums are empty and closed. Please tell us more about the Museum Anywhere project. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. First of all, I would like to welcome and uh, like greet everybody and uh, to tell that it's very exciting to be here and, and have this such a uh, like nice audience. And uh, our journey to Wack Fellowship started like in the middle of war, and we uh, were in the rush, like all the civil society here, to help the cultural sector to survive. And we were helping to museums and all cultural institutions to evacuate collections, to do some things, to preserve the heritage. And this idea uh, like, uh, uh, was um, aimed to solve the very particular problems. As already Kitty said, the Ukrainian museums are empty now, the collections are evacuated. And people are deprived the access to their heritage, which is where it hurts when such things happen around you because you have to be rooted to your culture. It's a very patriotic element of your life. And the museums in this situation, they hardly perform, they value codifying an educational function. Now you see the real photo taken yesterday. 
uh, on the previous slide, it's from the Taras Shevchenko Museum. So you can see how museums look right now in Ukraine. And basically what we decided to do, we are quite small Web3 agency, but we have a production studio, a multimedia content production studio. And we decided to make a volunteer project together with National Taras Shevchenko Museum, because this museum preserves the legacy of Taras Shevchenko, who is the poet, artist, and he is kind of a spiritual leader for Ukrainian nation. And it's a very important element of our culture. So we decided to bring art of Taras Shevchenko back to people and uh, have this element of Web3 in the project uh, because those we like, selected two technologies, AR, which brings and makes your museum to be anywhere you want because it can bring art to a daily life, like into a regular environment. And the um, Web3 technology could uh, help us to create, a, first of all, like know our audience, to mean the token, to award the audience, to bring to build the community, and to continue to foster this idea of uh, communicating, educating people, and onboarding them in Web3, which is uh, quite a normal thing in Ukraine right now. Because uh, why Web3? Uh, on the next slide, you will see that Ukraine uh, is doing very well in terms of crypto adoption. We are third in the world and first in Europe. And almost 16% of people have the uh, like uh, cryptocurrency here. And we have a, a legalized crypto sector. So for us, it's a already ongoing process. And then we would like to make it faster for the cultural institutions. So I'll, I'll give word to Alex, who will tell us about you about our customer journey and about our project in detail. Yeah, yeah. So we decided to build a simple web application. Basically, this is the uh, um, just 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 a website, but uh, with the possibility to do AR and uh, yeah, Web three. So uh, this is the yeah real photo we've taken. We put a QR code on the museum, and uh, with uh, your phone, with the phone, user can scan the QR code and uh, actually reach our web application. Here, there is a small uh, like explanation about the project and the requirements, and then he can start his journey. We uh, ask them for an email to, to, to track them, to be in touch for future. And uh, then we give a, um, inside an application, we give a simple instruction what would happen next. That user will be will go through the uh, 10 uh, artworks of Taras Shevchenko in a small journey, like seeing everything in uh, augmented reality through his phone. And yeah, just a simple instruction. Uh, and uh, then at this point, like uh, application switch to full screen uh, camera view, and user can start searching for for images. First image would be right uh, next to the QR code. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a like a rough uh, uh, like prototype we were already built and tried with a, with a small painting. There is a bit issue with scaling. It's going to be bigger, but at least you give, uh, you have an idea how that uh, would work. Uh, yeah. Then um, also uh, uh, in our application, there is a like simple functionality where user can click uh, informational item and read uh, a bit more about this uh, painting. Also, he has a possibility to click map and see the full journey if he's lost at some point or like stop and he can see the all the uh, where all the paintings located. Uh, also, uh, we yeah we already did tests and plan to have a you know a navigational errors inside an application in in AR if user lost, but also it's it's possible to just look at the map and uh, at some point like after the first painting, user are able to. Uh, get a digital souvenir. So uh, we, um, in collaboration with the Shevchenko Museum, we are going to issue two uh, digital copies of the Shevchenko works. So you can choose one of the uh, one of the digital souvenirs, and uh, so the Kukai, which probably would be the most the easiest way for the newcomer users to be onboarded to Web3, which where they just need to connect their social network account and they can mint uh, their artwork, get the digital souvenir and uh, have a, it as a proof of attendance and maybe for the future uh, activities under uh, our, yeah, every, anywhere museum. Uh, yeah, I, I need to mention the, our uh, third team member, Lena, which uh, a designer and UX, uh, engineer, I would say, which did a great job uh, doing it. And I'm now working on the 
um, implemented it in the code uh, back to you, Thais. And uh, basically, we have uh, uh, like several next steps. The project uh, in full scale will launch on the July in the summer. Uh, we plan to use it in Kiev and adapt it for the cultural diplomacy and go with this experience to several other countries uh, with the help of our embassy. Also, we uh, aim to the community building and co like conducting several educational events on Web3 and the uh, Web3 technology for cultural sector as well. And also, we want to make some international collaborations to create the next experiences. And we are open if you have any questions, any proposals, uh, or you just want to ask something, you are free to follow us and to ask. And we will be happy to, to be with you and to answer. Thank you. The, the resilience that you are building is just amazing. And I think I just want to ask you guys, are you okay? How do you have all the energy to do this? Uh, it's, uh, it's not that difficult because uh, we on the, you know, we are in the situation when everything happens very quickly and we take decision, we just, you know, doing. We are not thinking, we just doing. We have to think at the same time. We don't have much time to... To think that's basically we are in very energetic mood <laughs> yeah maybe crisis brings that out of people and uh where where the users can see this art that you display in ai actually it's a very nice location in ukraine because we are lucky to have all the major museums located around the one big square it's a park and it's named after Taras Shevchenko. And we have a big monument there, which is also closed. And we plan to locate like several QR codes on that, you know, coverage of the monument. So they will have the walk in the museum area in the park of Taras Shevchenko. And they will see the work of works like artworks of Taras Shevchenko. And probably we like expect that other museums will join us and will place their works in the same park. So it will be kind of an art area that works in the Kiev right now. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the audience because we do have some time for another question. Uh, Lena has one. What are, what are the greatest benefits of decentralized museums in your view, also in relation to how people may live in the future? Uh, Actually, that's another very important and interesting theme. Uh, it's uh, all about the curatorship because curatorship is different in, in uh, decentralized museums. And uh, uh, we can develop kind of a new types of approach uh, to art, to codify the value of art. And decentralized museums, they can have those elements of self-governance, of being anywhere, not tied to a certain location. And it's very interesting you know, sometimes to build a virtual museum or metaverse of a painter of artist whose actual works are located in like different places all over the world, but you can bring it together. So technologies give you amazing opportunities and Web3 that in my opinion, it's exactly what the modern culture needs in 21st century because it's democratic, it's open. And, uh, you know, I like this, uh, I like this phrase from the MOCA, you know, they in their manifesto, who decides? So it brings institutions closer to people and allows this interaction. Thank you so much uh, for all the energy that you've put into this project. And I really hope that we could help you. Uh, Thank you to all your team. Thank you. Over the last four months. Our next one on stage is going to be Anna. Anna, please share your screen. Anna, Anna Nazo is a performance artist and an educator who explores the role of Web3 in her AI neurotech performance art with visitor participation in virtual environments. So the project is developed together with New Art City, a virtual gallery, and supported by FX Hash. Anna, the mic is yours. Please tell us more. Thank you so much for the introduction, Kitty, and thank you so much to all presenters. It's real privilege to be uh, among such an amazing um, organizations and to see all the projects today. So uh, my work fellowship project is called AI Dreams for My Drone Sister. 
Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you the concept. Um, this work is an iteration of my solo exhibition that was part of New York City Festival in 2022. Uh, this project operates as a case study to explore Web3 AI neurotech performance art with visitor participation in virtual environments uh, using 360 degree imaging that are turned into generative NFTs. Uh, created in collaboration with the developer, Winston Trebers and New York City Virtual Gallery, it uses Tezos-based platform FXHash. So now we'll show you a demo of a virtual space. So it has a generative background as well, so it changes its colors um, as it usually happens during the kind of change between day and night. So this project looks at how digital, physical and digital performance, some of the examples you can see now on, on the screen, uh, could be translated into dynamic NFTs without losing its sense of liveness, being in the present moment, duration, um, that just disrupted dimensionalities of time and unique and repeatable user audience experience. While you're in the space, and you will be able to click on the video. That is still in the mode. That will bring you to um, the space where you will be able to get uh, a link to FXHash platform. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to get more information about the piece itself and uh, what the project is um, doing. So uh, this space, um, um, kind of New York City virtual uh, environment, um, and if I operates in that sense as an entry point for the project and allows you to navigate the space and choose one of the works that you would like to engage with. Um, by choosing the link above, uh, by pressing on the link above, uh, you will be able to go to FXHash project page uh, that will enable you to uh, generate your new kind of tears. So now I'm going to show you a preview from um, FXHash um, NFT generating page. So each NFT, uh, you see like just one of the examples um, on the screen right now. Um, which uh, will will um, will contains uh, uh, an excerpt from the video performance of the user's choice based on the unique hash assigned by the platform. Uh, the NFTs also will include a line of AI poetry linked to the video excerpt generated. Uh, this virtual exhibition and its first um, in a series NFTs drop will be launched on Tuesday, 30th of May, 2023, which is next week, and will be limited, uh, will be limited edition of 22 NFTs. It will be used as a fundraiser for an ongoing collaborative research project, SWERF. And now I will guide you back to the um, New York City exhibition space to show you the teaser of this project. Uh, SWERF um, is a research project that investigates radically different ethical aesthetic narrative ecologies in collaboration with indigenous communities, enabling critical cross-cultural ways of knowledge production through innovative storytelling in modern human, in modern human worlds. So this is um, kind of a video that shows, um, kind of gives a glimpse on this project and the first uh, collaboration that we are um, working on with uh, Mexican Indigenous Collective Casa Corpo. Thank you so much for your time. And if you're interested in knowing more about um, kind of either of the aspects of the project, uh, please get in touch. Thank you very much, Anna.
uh it's been so exciting to see you like dealing with all the complexity and i think that's one of my questions is about uh you've been collaborating with many organizations and the creative coder and participated in all the sessions has it been difficult to like coordinate all these moving parts um well i think i have been lucky in the sense um and working with amazing people and uh, largely it did come quite naturally but of course uh, i think it's part of the process when you face some challenges and limitations um but it also was exciting just to see how the work will evolve going through all those different steps thank you uh any questions from the audience you you got a lot of really good feedback though uh, people oh, are saying you. brilliant amazing uh following you on twitter uh so yeah it sounds like you are getting really good feedback thank you so much congratulations uh and if no more questions for anna uh fanny just shared the the link so you can go and uh, click around in the exhibition and try it for yourself. And I invite uh, Sarah to share her screen. Sarah Johanna Tyer is a curator focusing on time-based art practices and techno-social entanglements. She works with a team in Haus der Kunst München. They are building community en engagement in collaboration with the artist Sarah Friend for the Echoes Performance Program this summer. Sarah, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much um, for having me here. Um, echoing Anna, I want to say um, it's really great to be part of uh, the project. And um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce you here to this uh, rather modest project in comparison to what we've heard before um, that we've been preparing at Hustle Kunst um, during the WAC or WAC Fellowship. Um, the project I'm going to present um, is, sorry, I just have to move the um, bar of the notes here. Um, it's going to be a digital souvenir NFT that we're um, done in collaboration with Sarah Friend, who is um, an artist and software developer. Um, so this is like a new commission for us. Um, and we're super excited to launch this in July um, 21st to 23rd in the context of a performance program that we're doing at Haus der Kunst in Munich. Um, Echoes is, as I said, a performance program. We call it a live exhibition. Um, and it usually uh, offers something for people or for the audience to take home with them, which is also a little bit this idea of um, the artworks uh, leaving the museum, maybe a um, mini version of the decentralized museum. And this year, we invited the artist Sarah Friend to develop um, a digital echo, um, which will be obviously the thing that people will be um, taking home. And um, we hope that they will keep this digital souvenir and um, the concept of the project that Sarah Friend is developing um, includes um, yeah, the idea for people to, as in the actual echo which sort of like comes back to you in a transformed way could also come back in the next iterations of echoes and be transformed and built upon um the reason why um we at house to kunst i uh, think it's important to engage in web3 um is primarily because we're a museum for contemporary art um and we don't have our own collection we're publicly funded and i think um inside of these um you know shifting economic ecologies with like gift economy and market economy merging. Um, it's really important for us to be part of the discussions about uh, new economic models, um, but also maybe, you know, unorthodox economic thinking. And we really want to integrate this in our um, institutional practice. Um, so uh, yeah, for example, through implementing alternative forms of exchange as we're doing it within this project. Um, we always try to think through the arts, um, also when we engage with economics but or politics. So for us, it's really key to work with artists and thinkers such as Sarah Friend 
um, who has described the internet as the biggest sculpture ever made, which for us was really an interesting uh, point, highlighting also to all our colleagues who are maybe not so familiar with um, digital technologies, how art can actually contribute to this uh, discussion and why we should be uh, part of this um, space. Um, and I'm borrowing here words from Alexandra Marat, she's an art critic um, and who has described NFTs as a performance of exchange, um, which for me again highlights why such a project should be in the context or should be presented in the context of a performance um, program. And um, to close this on a more practical note, um, we know our audiences quite well, um, but they are also very diverse, um, especially age-wise. Um, we cater to an audience uh, from 20 to 60 years. Um, and we know that since they will be coming to a performance festival, um, they, they have a quite open, maybe experimental mindset. Um, they probably own a smartphone, but they might not have engaged with Web3 yet. So we try to be as uh, welcoming as possible and we will provide all the information they need printed on their individual uh, festival passes which i think will really help onboard people to the project um, we will issue 222 nfts and um, our kpi is that hoping um, if 80 people will actually claim them and maybe half of those people will return next year still um, yeah with their NFT um, and able to build on it for the future iterations. Um, so my uh, last um, comment, um, I guess, uh, is, uh, yeah, just that I would love to stay in touch with uh, all of you. I really love the projects that have been presented so far. Um, I think it's really deeply inspiring. And thank you also to the White Fellowship. Um, it was a great uh, journey. Um, I want to invite you to join us in Munich um, for the ECHOS Festival, which is sadly after um, the digital program of um, the Deutsche Museum. And um, yeah, if later on in the breakout rooms, anyone wants to discuss or share experiences and ideas how to maintain this community um, throughout the years, or like in between, um, you know, the, the actual like activation moments, um, I'd love to discuss that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Why 222? Um, well, that's based on um, the capacity of the space, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we think that we will probably sell 100 passes and then we have space for 200 people um, in for like every day of performances. And then we kept a couple of them for like friends and family so we can be sure to distribute like enough but not too many okay that that makes sense and why do you think it's important that that the audiences retain their wallet well because the the concept um, of the echo um, as something that comes back in a transformed way is that several friend would do another iteration or maybe also you know in the future other artists working in that space um, could like build on what we already started and maybe change the NFT that people already have, you know, like mm. augment it or add to it in some way. And uh, one question about the artwork: Is it created by Sarah uh, part of as part of the festival, or is it linked to works that are presented at the festival? It's in, that's a great question. Thanks. Uh, it's an individual work um, that's created by Sarah Friend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think many of us are looking forward to see you. Some people are telling they surely will be one of the owners of these NFTs. So one is sold. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one on stage is going to be Richel. Richel, please share your screen. Uh, Tina Sajiva and Rachel Marcelin are both assistant curators at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Sri Lanka. With their team, they have a strong focus on education and in collaboration with Nan Wallet, they prototyped a proof of learning token as an incentive for studying. Um, Mitchell, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Katie. We really share the emotions of the other teams as well. It's been a 
quite a journey for us as well, deep diving into Web3 blockchain. And all of this uh, sometimes felt really new to us as well. I uh, really want to thank all of you from PM Museum, the community, uh, Kitty, Diane, Maxime, everyone who's been really spearheading all of this, uh, Tezos and all the partners that are helping out as well. Uh, and also within our team, we had multiple uh, team members coming from different departments helping yeah. out, and it's been a joy learning and uh, prototyping. Uh, but just to quickly introduce us, uh, we are from Sri Lanka, we are the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, and we are based in Palambo as a, a public museum for the enjoyment of all publics uh, and schools, especially. And it's within our identity to. Yes, we are looking at modern and the past to preserve and take care, but also to the contemporary and to the future. And uh, this keeps on uh, leading us into innovation and looking at more ways of uh, looking at art, but also education, that is one of our main pillars. Um, and as we see how art has changed from, from the past to the modern and the contemporary, uh, it is our audience's expectations also change and it's part of our museum obje objectives is that we also cater uh, to new ways of learning and enjoyment uh, and that's been a real strive in our little prototype that we want to see eventually in the future as a big potential uh, and I will allow you know, to explain more about the project itself. Thank you Rachel. Uh... So just to uh, give you a brief introduction into our project, uh, the working title is called MMCA Museum of School, and it aims to introduce uh, um, aspiring museum professionals in Sri Lanka uh, to foundational and basic knowledge and skills that they would need to be when interpret and uh, uh, hopefully discuss visual art with the public. <clears throat> it's mainly uh, geared towards our own visit educators who are young learners employed by uh, us, uh, the institute, and the way we are going to in uh, incentivize them and motivate these uh, uh, these users is through uh, NFT collectibles that they can receive after completing uh, courses. So, just to show you a quick uh, demo of what we've done, uh, we've used uh, third-party applications, uh, even though uh, they are Web two-based applications. Uh, just to show you this, they're going through this course called Slow Looking, which helps uh, educators and uh, visitors alike to uh, look at art uh, in a much more uh, meaningful way. And they would have to answer an MCQ question that would test their knowledge as well. And then after that, they are allowed to put in their wallet address and click on submit to receive their NFT. And that's a basic uh, idea of what the prototype is and the potential for this is we would we would ideally like this to be a decentralized application uh, where it would all be uh, one streamlined process instead of it switching out from different third-party applications uh, to put in your wallet address or even going through the content they would ideally sign in they would go through the content, complete them, and have the NFT in their wallet at the end of the day. And we would also like this to be, uh, the first stage of this is to for internal staff only, and then later on we would like it to be rolled out to different institutions, museums, galleries, and schools as well. Schools as well. Uh, back to you, Richel, to wrap it up. Thanks, Simon. And this is the big potential that we understand our context as well and the, what we want to try out with, but eventually this is something the institutions, schools, uh, developers, then really can look forward to with web three integrated learning and completely change how we look at education as a whole. Um, we are also prototyping with uh, courses that are learning about web three and blockchain and NFTs and setting up their wallet, even before looking at art-based and museum-focused learning. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, such an interesting journey and this is where we stand and this is where we need your help as well as to, uh, with the expertise, maybe even funding that we would grow uh, as a project, but as a, also an institution that looks forward to the future. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard and Tina. Uh, I have a question about the, the educative role of a museum. How do you see this educative role evolving together with the technology? Um, interesting question, uh, Kitty. It's, it's been always been in a identity to us. Identify education because of the role of the museum in a context where it's there. Oh, yeah. Knowledge building takes different roles and knowledge build um, um, maybe through very standardized, very backward thinking ways. And I think museums and institutions and especially focused institutions have this uh, to create education in a much more enjoyable, credible way. And we see education like that, that's more fun and much more accessible and much more adaptable. Uh, and technology plays right into it where anyone Anyone has access wherever they are uh, in whatever project they are in. Thank you very much. Uh, the next on stage is ah yeah, there is a question about your Twitter and in, in, in Instagram accounts, and also yeah, maybe if you can just share some links. Uh, in the chat for Sri Lankan artists, because I think men, very few of us knows about Sri Lankan art. So I, I think it would be very interesting for the audience. So uh, a few links in the chat, please. And the next on stage is Magaidi. Please share your screen and get ready. Magaidi Pines is a legal consultant and a board member at the Vukoma Kandi Foundation, where they con connect and enrich the Maroon community as a whole by stimulating and facilitating participation projects, both educational and cultural. In their experiment, they reimagine re re traditional pangi prints as generative art. Magaidi, we are excited to hear more. The mic is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Very happy to be here today uh, with all of you and very proud to be part of uh, such an uh, inspiring community and, uh, and process. Uh, so I'm Megaidi Pinas uh, on behalf of uh, Welcome Akandi here today. Um, and Welcome Akandi, like it is a, said, is a uh, foundation that aims to uh, preserve the Okanisi culture, culture and spread more knowledge and awareness about it. Um, and especially for the younger generations and others, um, um, others than the Okanisi themselves that are interested in, uh, in our cultural and uh, history. And the Web3 uh, technology really gives us the opportunity to uh, reach our goal in a whole new way, a way that can uh, really make our cultural future proof. And um, yeah, we have created or we are creating an NFT uh, exhibition um, and the exhibition will be based on traditional Pangi patterns. And a Pangi is one of the best known Okanisi expressions and um, the Pangi patterns will be combined with photos that were found in uh, our Dutch National Archive. And um, these photos are already part of our, uh, our uh, exhibition, Hidden Colonial Heritage Back to the People. And our main goal is to inspire and collect stories uh, that emerge out of the NFT uh, exhibition or collect hidden stories that already exist about our culture. And uh, these stories will be bundled and um, it will be, it, people, the visitors of our exhibition can make uh, NFTs themselves. And these NFTs uh, that are based on the existing NFTs will, um, will be uh, a new exhibition in the future. So um, yeah, I will now show you what our main purpose uh, main purpose is. And our main purpose is really, um, yeah, by combining uh, the well-preserved cultural by our elders within the com community um, with emerging technologies, we want to make our her heritage filter-proof and we aim to transfer our cultural and heritage in a way that resonates with the younger generations and the wider community and also a community that is willing to invest in the preservation of our culture. And the project 
will be uh, on our website. Um, we are aiming to launch in uh, August. And um, yeah, you can come all come back uh, at our website in August and they will show the link uh, after my, uh, my pitch. Um, and why should you participate in a project? Now you, you should participate in a project to gain and share more knowledge about the Akanishi culture in a modern and engaging way. And by participating in this project, you are supporting our mission to uh, preserve it. And uh, by sharing your stories or creation in NFT form, you can help spread more awareness of our uh, traditions and uh, you can really help us pursue uh, our mission. And before I'm going to show our first drafts, uh, I'm going through our roadmap. So today is our first phase, the, uh, the work demo, and um, I will show you a preview. And the second phase is really the launch in August. And we will also have a real life uh, events to get more awareness for our, uh, our exhibition. And uh, as said, the visitors can uh, uh, immediately create NFTs themselves. And at the end, we will, like I said, bundle the, the NFTs and create a new exhibition um, based on the NFTs created by you. And um, you can also purchase the NFTs and with the, with the donations or the funding, we, um, we will uh, finish the, the museum we are now building on behalf of the Okanisi cultural in uh, the Tabiki. So um, that's also a reason why you should participate in, uh, in this, uh, this journey with us. And we have um, just recently uh, received the first drafts of, uh, of our uh, exhibition. And here is a little sneak peek how, how it will look. Um, so these are the traditional Pangi patterns, and it will be combined with pictures out of the Dutch National Archives. And yes, really excited. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you all uh, in August. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Magaidi. Uh, is, am I right? This is a traveling exhibition, right? So where else we can see it? You're muted. Magaidi, you are muted. Goodness. Yes, it's a traveling uh, exhibition. This this uh, will be on uh, on our website, of course. But the photo exhibition is now a traveling expedition. It started in uh, the Netherlands, and uh, it's uh, now currently in Suriname. And at the end, it will be uh, staged in the museum that we are building in the Tabiki in Suriname, and it will be its end uh, end place, his home. Um, so yeah, very excited. And what, how was your experience working with technology on one side and cultural heritage and tradition on the other side? Very new, <laughs> very um, yeah, still still grasping what it what it really means and can mean. Um, but it's very exciting, and I think this is the future. And if you want to reach uh, a broader audience, then this is the way to go, I believe. Thank you. Uh, one question I'm curious about, because I know that you've been pivoting quite a few times. I think yeah. you started the fellowship with something else, and then you arrived to here. How, how did that feel to you? Um, it, it seems like a really long, uh, long journey, but if you pivot that much, then it's, uh, it's like, uh, it's too short. We, we, uh, we need more time. Um, but with you guys, with the mentors and, uh, and all the, the people that are uh, here for us, um, you really make it, made it a more calm, uh, calm journey than it would have been without you. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you very much. And Fanny just shared your links in the chat. So if anybody wants to follow the Vukoma Kanti Foundation, uh, Thank you. All, all the links are there. And the next on, on stage is Anlor. Anlor, if you are ready, please share your screen. 
Uh, and Lori Anacek is a digital project director at the French Ministry of Culture. So together with her team, they are researching the impermanence of artist royalties and explore ways to use the potential of blockchain technology to safeguard sources of income for artists in the dynamic art market. And Lord, please tell us more, the mic is yours. Thank you, Kitty, for the presentation. Um, hi, everyone. I'm here with my fellows Ludovic and Axel from uh, French Ministry of Culture. Um, during WAC Fellowship, we explore myths and realities about royalty <clears throat> from the resale of NFT. I'd like to thank uh, all the person we met during um, the interviews who helped us with this issue, with a special thank to Smart Chain who helped us to write the paper um, on the topic. So the starting point um, of our research is a legal report on NFT. Uh, we, we published last July. And in this report, we learned that royalties payment is not operated on chain. So we wanted to better understand the mechanism. And that's what we did during WAC fellowship. So why royalties are not uh, automatically applied on chain? In fact, it's a matter of standard. At the origin, blockchain were made for a simple transfer transaction, and it's not allowed to make a payment transfer in addition to a simple token transfer. It's the rule. Um, then payment transaction for NFT are not um, a, a part. When platform pay royalties, they only read royalties rule written on smart contracts. In fact, royalty re rely on the goodwill of, of platform. And this um, explain how Blur was able to cancel royalties. After that, after this discovery, we wanted to explore the idea of standard evolution. And we learned from coders that it is quite complex. Building a new standard to force payment on chain would impact all types of transactions, even those that are free. For example, token transfer to the to, to the um, a wallet of the same person, uh, this would be impact. Uh, and this happens a lot in blockchain. Um, also, if uh, we think about coding payment in smart contracts, coders, coders told us lots of workarounds. For example, you can add a new smart contract um, on an NFT which replace the initial one and cancel royalty initial rules. So it's complex to make standard blockchain standard evolve. So if we are thinking about what's next, um, here are some ideas we could explore. In Europe, the income from the resale of visual art is already a legal right. <clears throat> it is the resale right. We could imagine to implement it on platform or somewhere in blockchain. Also, artists told us, um, when we, we interviewed them, artists told, told us that a, um, a, a property tax would be a way to guarantee an income for them, in addition to royalty system, a, a legal, like a, a legal tax. Um, and this is also the idea of uh, Ethereum creator. He recently, he talked about the Hoburger tax on the blockchain. Well, today, after, after our weeks of study, we, we believe it's useful to broaden the spectrum, as we also learn that resale royalties is not a sustainable source of income for artists. Finding solution considering artists at the center of NFT economic models could be a good topic to focus on now. And this is why in continuity of the, our present work on royalties, we want to organize a conference around, around remuneration of artists. Um, WAC Fellowship was a great journey, but now we have to go into a new one. I think with more projective works to develop recommendation for artists 
um, around all remuneration topics for them uh, with the blockchain and the platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anlor. Uh, the mentioned artist, how do they get in touch if somebody wants to contribute to your project? What, what's next for them? For, uh, the question is what's next for artists from the if, French Ministry yes, of Culture? If, if somebody wants to contribute, because you were saying ah. that you invite artists to contribute, but yes. how can they? What, what are what are some ways of contribution for artists here? And what what are the next steps in the in the research? The next step is to share the the paper in the in the community, and we hope that. Uh, artists will take part of the um, more produ productive uh, work on the, on the topic and um, based on the on, on our research here in WAC fellowship we want to organize an event at the, the ministry uh, to share all the topics and issues around around royalties um, mechanism evolution in blockchain and uh, platform but also on remuneration of artists in the um, NFT economic models to broaden the, the spectrum of uh, um, royalties. Because in fact, uh, we learned that um, artists, they didn't earn a lot with uh, resale royalty. We, by now we need to secure it, but as it's not um, a, 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 a good way to earn, um, um, income from the arts, we think it's important to, to broaden and talk more about uh, economic models with artists in the middle. And you're hosting an in-person meeting. Who, who are you inviting there? We, we didn't work on it we <laughs> didn't have, uh, by now. We have to think of the events when it takes place and uh, who can will part, participate. Okay, and how people can get in touch with you if they want to contribute? Why well, they can send me an email. <laughs> okay, so we will share your email address in the chat. Yes. Awesome, thank you very much. Thank and you. Next on stage is Nick and Joanna. Please share your screen. Joanna Petkiewicz and Nick Mihan are founders of a new in initiative they are launching, I think right here today, is that correct? Uh, it's called Superposition, and it's a project of the Institu Institute for Sound and Music in Berlin. This initiative aims to launch an annual donation campaign of digital art for urgent charitable causes. Super curious to hear more. The floor is yours. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you for listening. And also, um, it's a pleasure to be in this very kind of uh, pivotal moment, I think, in terms of uh, conclusion of the WAC Fellowship. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that's been coordinating and helping us uh, get to this point so far. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be a part of this. So my name is Nick Mian. I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Sound and Music. And, um, and also with Joanna, the co-founder of a new entity called Superposition. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. It's been such an inspiring day. So we established uh, the Institute for Sound and Music, ISM, in 2016, following a partnership with the KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin. And based on that experience, our goal was to create the clearest possible channel between artists and their audiences through the right team, the right tools, the right technologies, the right locations, and the right artists. And, um, and from this point, we formed ISM as a nonprofit dedicated to sound, immersive art, and music. And the ISM produced a large-scale traveling installation exhibition format, which featured works from 
Brian Eno, Holly, Holly Herndon, Ben Frost, Tom York from Radiohead, um, Suzanne Ciani, and many others. And after his successful showcases in uh, Berlin's Gropiusbau and multiple cities throughout North America, the pandemic abruptly halted our trajectory, which provided us with a rare opportunity. And that was time to think about how we move forward as a viable and sustainable organization. And for the past year, we have been incubating an idea of a service that could help us add a layer to existing fundraising audience engagement tools that we already use. And we have been looking at innovations in adjacent industries like film and obviously gaming, which have demonstrated vast potential for sustainability models. And we also realize that at present, there are only few services that deploy these technologies in a way that addresses the needs specific to us and the independent art sector. So we decided to create it ourselves and make it a long-term endeavor. And we borrowed the term superposition from geology, as well as quantum mechanics, where it is used to describe a process of placing one thing on top of the other so they can coincide. And the function of superposition as a company and a service is to place another layer of tools, in this case, Web3 tools, on top of existing infrastructure to enable an organization like ours to in principle, sustain itself long term. And as a model, it steers away from project based economy. And as a team working in the sector for a really long time, we are quite uniquely positioned to address these complex challenges ourselves and we face them daily. So we want to be our own use case to start with and share it for the benefit of other users in the sector in the near future. And so the inaugural project of Superposition is called Project One, which is designed to be a perpetual donation campaign for charity. So in Project One, digital art is donated to the campaign collection through a four month public call. Uh, the selected art is minted into the collection with parameters ensuring royalty distributions uh, to the contributing artist, but predominantly to a selected charity based on all future transactions of the artworks in the campaign collection. And so as future transactions will continue to generate royalties, a new ch charity recipient is selected by the artwork collection contributors each year. So our hope is that this collection can be initiated by the members of the, the WAC Fellowship and people that might be tuning in right now. And, uh, and really this is a way for us to provide, uh, for all of us to provide um, what we believe is possible through the, through our 16 weeks um, exploring these technologies together. And that is to deploy Web3 to support the public good through the power of art and culture. So here is our call to action. Um, we would love to invite all the members of this year's fellowship, as well as artists and collectors and anyone on this call who would love to get involved to partner us in the unfolding of the project one. And we would love to take advantage of this tremendous power of the group here and it's beyond learning together to also see what we can achieve as a gathering. So all you need to do to participate is simple and that's donate a digital artwork for which the artist will receive perpetual royalties and if you don't have one you can get in touch because we can you we can provide one with you for you to sponsor and if you'd like to join join the campaign we'd love to hear from you our emails will be in the chat and thank you for listening. We hope you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation and also for being part of the program. Uh, brilliant. Someone is telling this is brilliant. Uh, it's a beautiful vision also. I, the, the question I have is, how do you think the technology will mostly help with the art charity model in the long run? Uh, I mean, we've seen examples uh, where these perpetual royalty mechanisms do work. And so what we're seeing, what we're looking at is, you know, a lot of it has to do with these, the, the technology does exist. It does, you know, it is available. And so the influence behind it and how that can channel um, support for impact is really what we're trying to identify here. And also it's a model that, you know, if you see this working, um, you can apply it um, to, you know, the the function of a of an organization or even uh, an individual. So, say for an artist. And so, what we're really trying to do here 
is um, one, to identify models that do work. And then based on those models, we can apply them to different aspects of our organization. If it works for that, if it works in that way, then it can work for others. And so it's it's a solution. Are there any parameters for the digital artwork that is to be donated? Do you have there, limitations? There are. And so, so the specifics of the parameters will be uh, provided towards the end of June. So what we're really looking, if, if people are interested in getting involved um, and we encourage this, uh, then get in touch within the next, we're saying June 9th, but within the next couple of weeks. And at the end of June, uh, the parameters will be announced and the public call will go from mm. end of June until um, September timeframe. So but the parameters, we, we can't talk about them just yet because there's still some dynamics that we're exploring. <laughs> it's changed, like, that's the crazy thing. I mean, everybody knows this. This is all these technologies are changing rapidly. And it's such a, uh, it's, that's what makes it so exciting to be a part of this. But it's also like, you know, sometimes we talk about like catching snowflakes or something like this. It's very, um, it's very interesting. So how do you, how do you design these models in a way that um, keeps this in mind, but is also future proof, and you know maintains the, uh, the the intentions of what the model was designed to do. And this is, you know, it's a tough challenge, but it's a good one. Yes, indeed. Uh, and I also know that from the beginning, you were one of the teams that was interested in a DAO model as well. And the many stays away from the DAO because it's hard to include people who are not so web savvy. So what has been your experience? We, we are, um, it, it, Project One will have what we're calling a, a, a simplified DAO. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we, we do want, uh, we do want the, the functionality of, of, of voting. For, so each year, each year the, uh, the charity will change because the, what we're calling urgent charitable cause, you know, that the, 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 the royalties um, to support something that um, is urgent one year might might need to be altered for the next. And so that's a really interesting way to get people together and the you know organizations or collectors or artists in general together to support um, something that can have this sort of perpetual function. And we feel that's a very good way to just um, have a DAO kind of structure just to uh, you know uh, to convene once a year, decide on a cause and make sure that the um, the royalties are being allocated responsibly. And if this all works out, where would you like to be in five years? How do you see this in the long run? Multiple models um, being, I don't know, at the center of extraordinary change across the cultural landscape of the world, <laughs> I guess. You know, I think that's like, that's, I think that's sort of the goal for all of us. You know, we're, we're, we're very much, um, you know, and I think that's, that's the, uh, you know, the sort of this kind of a thought in the back of our heads throughout the entire fellowship is just the potential for extraordinary change in this cultural landscape. And um, we're starting to see um, hints of this being possible. And we would love to see also having the necessary resources for long-term R&D and artists and cult cultural organizations like ours being re remunerated um, accordingly to the time we spend. So I think this is a big conversation also on royalties and resourcing ourselves in the future. I, I and I, I really, Joanna, you you say quite often um, the, the the notion that these mechanisms mechanisms can help us break free from this um, project based economy, and um, and so this is this is really you know kind of at the crux or the core of of a lot of what we do. Very exciting, and I really, really hope that you can keep up this enthusiasm at least for five years, but <laughs> uh, well, hopefully even more. And you've been the last presenters, so now we heard from all the fellows who participated in this fellowship. Uh, just a quick, quick reminder that we also have a proof of attendance token, uh, a very uh which is going to be shared in the chat again so if you want to claim your proof of attendance nft uh do it in the next 10 minutes 
And uh, a huge, huge thank you for everyone. And congrat congratulations. It's been so nice to see all the projects all at once. Uh, and I'm inviting Fanny uh, to give us a little bit of a, of a wrap up. Fanny Lakubai is a digital art advisor and a curator who has been advising collectors, artists, and projects on Web3 solutions since 2018 via her art advisory film, La Lal Art. Since 2021, she has been co-hosting the WAC Weekly and is a precious collaborator in the WAC Fellowship. Fanny, please. Thank you, Kitty. Um, and, uh, and thank you again to all the fellows uh, who uh, stepped really out of their comfort zone uh, today and complied with the, the very hard uh, four-minute rule uh, to present uh, their projects today. So... Uh, really great job, uh, everybody. I mean, it's just, um, you know, it it looks easy because it takes a lot of practice. And I just want to acknowledge like how much uh, work was uh, really put by by all of you. And uh, and also to to say that like many of you uh, began as participants uh, to the work weekly calls um, that uh, Diane mentioned uh, at the beginning because the work lab is really a, a series of um, of programs and uh, to really open up uh, the world of ideas uh, to apply blockchain technology solutions to uh, institutions uh, need. And uh, and with the fellows, we really, um, you know, like saw their ideas grow and flourish during the 12 weeks of intense learning and become a reality with uh, the assistance of tech integrators uh, with some reality check and major bumps and forks and, and change of plans uh, along the way. Um, because as, as Nick said, this is like uh, the way you work with new technology is really, really catching uh, snowflakes. I mean, I think that's uh, very true and, and I could not have uh, put it uh, better uh, than you did. And and in, in that, like to not get caught into the um, you know, like the process of things and the opportunities as well, because everything is literally possible. So you're like, oh, oh, and what about this? And what about that? And then you're like, okay, let's focus. And and the first step is always the hardest, uh, but it is a very important one to take uh, to allow for uh, for many more. And uh, hopefully for those who uh, attended uh, today's uh, presentation, we hope that these projects have opened up new ideas and potential uh, applications, uh, even maybe for your own uh, institution. And, and we, it was really our goal was to broaden the horizon of possibilities for arts and cultural uh, institutions to experiment uh, with uh, these uh, Web3 snowflakes. And uh, But that is, is really always done uh, within uh, one's uh, own um, value system uh, aligned uh, with your mission and in agreement with your current uh, community. And I just want to highlight a few uh, really positive outcomes that we've seen out of the projects um, that have been developed uh, during, uh, during the fellowship. Um, many of these projects, as you've seen today, had uh, goals beyond uh, short-term profits, such as preserving cultural education, preserving cultural heritage, education, um, charity causes, developing communities, and uh, long-term economic models. Uh, we've also, we're very excited to, uh, to see IRL experiences uh, of distributing uh, digital souvenirs or proof of attendance, uh, where the focus was really on the customer journey uh, to ensure that like you do not lose people at the first like uh, technical jargon and uh, and what the heck is this um, thing I have to download and that I do not know about. So it's really like smooth uh, audience engagement and inclusion uh, into museum programming to me is uh, really uh, exciting uh, to move uh, forward. Alongside with many collaborations as well, uh, which is uh, sort of a um, like Web3 really opened up, uh, I, in my opinion, the possibilities to partner with artists, marketplaces, mentors, other institutions uh, in 
in that spirit of moving the needle forward. I think we all understand that we're in this new technology together and that we're building something new and that we all need to help each other to, um, you know, like get somewhere uh, all together. So that's really exciting and 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 I must say quite refreshing uh, to uh, to see. And finally, I think the fellows all became like champions of these innovations within, within their own institution, um, educating their teams uh, further uh, into the right direction and, and really continuing that like decentralization of learning, you know, like our job is done, but now uh, you continue, um, you know, passing the baton. I think that's uh, really the, uh, the important uh, uh, message uh, here. And you know, it's it's often too bad that the news headlines uh, that reach the mainstream audience uh, only cover short-term speculations like yeah, NFTs, crypto fiascos, like you know auction records, and hopefully with work uh, programs, uh, events like this, uh, documentation, and a lot of energy and positivity. I think we really hope to uh, shift the narrative towards a long-term applications of blockchain in existing industries uh, like the arts and, and culture sector. And uh, it might be less sensational than the crypto scam, uh, but I think, and I hope you agree with me, like much more rewarding and sustainable uh, in the long run. So thank you very much uh, everybody for being here uh, today. I think this really means a lot to uh, us, to the fellows and to everybody who's supporting us uh, in this journey. Back to you, Kitty. It's to the end. Yeah, to the I end. think I will. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fanny. You've been here from the start, and it's always such a pleasure to collaborate um, with you. And, and I know that we will do even more in, uh, in the next month or even weeks. Um, just to, to end these two amazing hours, I wanted to remind everyone that um, this is our season two, so it means that we had a season one. And it's really thanks to all the fellows who joined the season one last year. They were bold enough to, to come and experiment with us. It's really thanks to them that um, we could create an inspiring path um, for the participants to join the season two. And obviously, we are um, thinking about season three because what has been developed in season two has been just mind blowing. It's so diverse, it's so impact driven, it's so innovative, it's creative, it's a uh, yeah everything that we could <laughs> dream of. Um, it's really mind blowing, and it's totally exceeded our expectations. So, um, thank you so much. It's not easy, I can tell you. Like four months every week. Um, you are all so motivated and, and <laughs> wow, um, congrats, congrats, because it's uh, it's not easy and you've done it. Uh, so yeah, uh, bravo. <laughs> so yeah, season three will kick off in the autumn right after the Cold Fork application that we will have for the WAC Fellowship. Um, uh, and yeah, we will kick off, sorry, uh, in the autumn work quickly, and then we will kick off the call for application for the work fellowship season three. So stay tuned. I wanted to give a big thank you to uh, the Tezos ecosystem, the Tezos Foundation, um, and especially Valerie Whitaker and all of the Tezos entities who have been supporting us from the start. A big heart for TZ Connect um, who doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but we really created work together and part of the team here um, has been with us from the start thanks to this entity. Thank you so much to Fanit, Kitty, to Maxim, Tamash, Katush, Victor, Nadia, Anita, Ivan, Ian. You know, it's, it's a big team actually behind WAC um, and uh, it has been a beautiful journey. And uh, I also wanted to say that we are preparing a really nice digest and a handbook. So really good documentation, <laughs> a lot of readings for your summer um, with really practical resources, open source tools, etc. So this will be published late June um, uh, if we go fast enough. <laughs> uh, and because we believe a good discussion is the beginning of everything, uh, let's open the networking room. We will have one hour of, of networking um, in another room. And I think that's it for me. Kitty, have I forgotten something? 
uh, maybe just the proof of attendance tokens, which are still available. Uh, we will share the link also in the networking room if you miss it now. Uh, and yeah, in the networking room, we are all going to be equal. So really imagine it as a meeting down in the cafe after the conference. Uh, and then you can go into separate rooms or we can stay all together, just some casual conversations uh, to kick off the future. And as soon as you click on that link, this will be this will be closed for you. Uh, but we are hoping to see you right there.